Israel says it's ramping up its strikes on Gaza as the world watches and waits for the moment tanks massed on the border roll into the Gaza Strip. And this week, some moments of relief in the darkness of war. Joy for one family as US hostages are released by Hamas after being abducted in that brutal assault on Israel. And some relief as aid trucks cross from Egypt into Gaza for the first time since the war erupted. It follows a week of diplomacy as leaders from around the world race to stop this conflict spreading. We cannot give up on peace. We cannot give up on a two-state solution. An explosion at a hospital in Gaza, still heavily contested, threw those efforts off course. Rishi Sunak flew to the Middle East to give support to Israel. We will stand with you in solidarity, we will stand with your people, and we also want you to win. Thank you. While back at home, the political sands look to be shifting. Labour Party, 11,719 votes. Two historic by-election victories put Sakir Starmer potentially on the path to taking Rishi Sunak's place on the global stage after the next general election. People are fed up to the back teeth Absolutely. with 13 years of decline under this government. As this horrific conflict continues to cause suffering for so many, what will it take to solve it? And how can our politicians play their part? With us in a moment to talk about what might come next is Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick. After Labour's big by-election wins, Lisa Nandy could soon be representing you all over the world. The Shadow International Development Minister is with us from Salford. As the UN calls conditions inside Gaza catastrophic, we'll speak to Dr Hanan Ashrawi, a woman who has spent decades at the heart of Palestinian politics. And we'll talk to Israel's former Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett. Good morning. Uh, you might have seen, by the way, that we were going to speak to Israeli President Isaac Herzog this morning. He has had to postpone, but hopefully he will be with us on a future programme. In the meantime, welcome to our panel this morning, Jasmine El Gamal, a Middle East East expert who advised the Obama administration. Also best-selling historian and TV presenter Simon C Seabag Montefiore and Lucy Fisher, the Financial Times Whitehall editor and host of its Political Fix podcast. Let's have a look at some of the front pages of the newspapers this morning. Uh, a lot of them reflect on the death of football legend Sir Bobby Charlton, who died yesterday at the age of 86. Others focus too on the conflict between Israel and Hamas. The Mail on Sunday says, Israel, we will strike the head of the snake, Iran. The Observer says, US holding Israel back from strike against Hezbollah. That's in Lebanon. And the Sunday Times goes with, Hamas chief lives in a council house he bought in Barnet. And finally, the Sunday Telegraph says, US tells Sunak to ban the Iranian terror guard. Well, let's talk to our panel this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the programme, all of you. Um, Jasmine, how do you assess where we are with this conflict today? Um, well, two weeks into the conflict, we're at a really critical juncture, both when it comes to the humani humanitarian situation and the military situation. So obviously, the humanitarian crisis is growing worse by the second. You have over 4,000 Pal Palestinians killed so far. Against that backdrop, the Israeli military is preparing for a ground invasion. Over 300,000 troops have been mobilized, and the Israelis say they plan on going in and dismantling and destroying Hamas. At the same time in the West Bank, so this is just in Gaza, settler violence against Palestinian residents has been increasing as the interior minister of Israel has armed those settlers with assault weapons, uh, calling them a civil defense for force of sorts. And then finally, in terms of the region, the U.S. is sending additional assets to the region, preparing for what could be an all-out regional war if Iran or Hezbollah get involved. And that, unfortunately, today is not something that we can take completely off the table. So how likely do you think that is to happen? 
it, de it, it depends on so many factors, but I think it mostly depends right now on the deterrence capability of the U.S. to Iran and to Hezbollah. They have these military assets there. It's showing, giving a huge sign. And there's also been conversations behind the scenes to say, listen, you do not want to be a part of this. You do not want to get involved in this. Simon, you're an expert on the history of the region. What can history tell us about where this might go next? Well, I mean, first of all, one's got to say dark times. You know, the Hamas um, kill raid on, on Israel, killing civilians was the greatest atrocity against Jewish people since the Holocaust and really belongs in, in Jewish history with the pogroms in Russia um, in the 1640s in the, in the early 20th century and the Crusades. Um, you know, the slitting of throats, the raping of women, um, the, the taking of hostages, all unprecedented really. Um, in terms of the State of Israel, it's the greatest crisis that the State of Israel has faced since independence in 48. Um, Israel has to scatter Hamas and launch an incursion in, into the Gaza, but it has a huge responsibility to do so surgically and to respect uh, Palestinian civilians. And that every Palestinian civilian matters as much as an Israeli civilian, and Hamas is not the Palestinians. So that is, a, a, that is an essential point. Um, in the wider, the wider conundrum for Israel is how to do this um, respecting civilians and yet at the same time uh, deterring Hezbollah in the north, as Jasmine says. In the bigger picture, um, they must um, be able in the future to talk to, them, uh, to talk to their Arab friends in the moderate world, in the Arab world. That is the future of the Middle East. Um, they have to deter Iran and, um, and they have to open a, a, a dialogue with the Palestinian Authority. In, okay. in the near future, and they, they mustn't do anything that would make that impossible. That's essential. Lucy, can I t ask you about domestic news, if I may? Uh, obviously, the by-elections this week, a, a double <coughs> triumph for Labour. Where does that leave Sakir Starmer? Where does that leave Rishi Sunak? Well, look, I think we've seen uh, Labour, uh, as much as they try and ward against complacency uh, and try to temper public expectations, really engaging in celebration this weekend after those historic results in mid-beds, uh, overturning the largest numerical majority ever in Tamworth, the second biggest swing to Labour in a by-election on record. Um, Starmer, I think, very much um, is hoping to build on this momentum, particularly after the other by-election success in Rutherglen and Hamilton West that suggests that Labour is uh, resurgent in Scotland. Uh, I think now they will just be trying to carry on with this caution strategy, the Mingvar strategy of ensuring that they don't um, rock the boats or lose um, the poll lead that they uh, have established. Things are very gloomy in Conservative circles. Uh, Rishi Sunak is under severe pressure following the defeats this week. Um, he's looking at demands from particularly the right flank of his party to forge ahead with tax cuts, something he's not uh, wanting to do because the public finances are so tight. There isn't the headroom to fund such tax cuts. Others on the right calling for ECHR membership to be back on the table again. So look, for fast forward to next month, we've got the King's speech, his party urging him to make bigger, bolder moves. We've got the autumn statement, the pressure for tax cuts will be on. Uh, and I think more broadly, there is a sense he needs to um, re-energise his administration, possibly with a wide-ranging reshuffle, because the reset he attempted at conference hasn't seemed to move the dial. OK, thank you for the moment. We'll be back with you very soon. Thank you. And uh, we'll ask, obviously be asking Robert Jenrick about uh, the pressure for tax cuts from some within his party a little later in the programme. But by any measure, the Labour Party has had a triumphant week. Even seasoned political journalists didn't think they would be able to take two ultra-safe Tory seats. Tamworth and Nadine Doris's former constituency, Mid Bedfordshire. But take them they did, making by-election history and overturning two big Tory majorities in the process. Of course, there is a way to go until the general election. But it does make it look a lot more likely that my next guest might soon be representing you on the world stage. Lisa Nandy is the Shadow Development Minister and she joins us from Salford. Good, good morning to you, Lisa Nandy. Good morning. Uh, now, the Prime Minister has written in one Sunday newspaper today that, quote, we all need to see all water supplies to Gaza restored where physically possible. Does Labour agree with that? 
Uh, absolutely. There, is, uh, there was a humanitarian crisis in Gaza long before the events, the appalling events of October the 7th. And the, there's now a humanitarian emergency that is threatening to tip over into catastrophe. There's a real issue about the scale of the aid that has gone in. There was a brief window of light over the last 24 hours where we saw 20 trucks go across the Rafa crossing but there's no corridor through Gaza at the moment so that that can reach people in northern Gaza and most importantly there's no agreement on fuel and there are serious practical challenges to overcome in order to resolve that particularly because if there's no fuel the water can't flow and the hospitals can't power up. I right, had a so, you're, so, you're, so you want water supplies restored and Israel should let fuel in? Well, there's, there's a practical issue about fuel that is currently being dealt with. I spoke to the UN humanitarian coordinator about this in the last 48 hours. The problem with fuel is that Israel is clearly very anxious about the prospect of Hamas getting their hands on the fuel and using it to launch rockets but the UN and Egypt and others are trying to broker a solution to that that would ensure that that fuel stays safely in the hands of the United Nations and okay. aid agencies and is used for the purposes it's intended but I can't stress the seriousness of this there are currently incubators being turned off in hospitals uh, for newborn babies because there isn't sufficient fuel to be able to keep the power on and we've got to make sure that that is resolved in within hours not days if Israeli troops do manage to eliminate Hamas. Who should run Gaza after that? Well, I think these are, these are longer term questions for the people in Gaza, the Palestinian people, for the international community to help broker, and of course for Israel as well. But do you have a vision? Does the Labour Party have a vision? Well, you want to, do you want to be representing Britain after the next election? What is your vision? Well, our, our vision remains two states living peacefully side by side but at the moment particularly for Palestinians for a long time that has seemed like a very distant prospect indeed and when we've resolved the immediate crisis when we've got hostages out and sufficient amounts of aid in we need to look at the longer term picture there was a peace summit in Cairo yesterday which laid bare the difficulties with doing that in the current environment minds are very much focused on the humanitarian emergency in Gaza and okay. the plight of the hostages right now but again but in, in, in the short term then do you think Israel should have a strategy about what happens to Gaza after a ground incursion well, we don't know what's going to happen in relation to a ground incursion. There's been talk about it for days. What we do know is that within hours, we've got to significantly scale up the amount of aid that is, um, that is going into Gaza, food, medicine, water and fuel. And we've got to make sure that we uh, elevate the efforts to release the hostages, many of whom are in a very critical situation at the moment okay. without access to the medication that they need. Longer term, what we need is the same sort of sustained effort between Palestine and Israel that we've seen in the region in relation to the Abraham Accords. There is a strong view amongst the Palestinians that that same effort has not been made on the issue of a two-state solution and we've got to show not just that we can keep the flame of hope alive through careful sustained diplomacy but show real progress and that will be a priority for the next Labour government. Can I ask you about what Keir Starmer said on the 11th of October? He was asked on LBC if an Israeli siege was appropriate, including cutting off power, cutting off water. And he replied, I think Israel does have that right. Why did he say that? He, he's clarified that this week that he was answering the previous question and then went on to talk about the importance of international law. I was with Keir on the 7th of October when we held a vigil at Labour Party conference uh, in support of Israeli civilians uh, and what had happened with the horrendous Hamas attack. He made the point at that vigil that international law must be respected and upheld and he's made it many, many times sure. since. But, I mean, the, pro the problem is it took him nine Nine days to issue the clarification you've just referenced and in that time a number of people in Britain's Muslim community have expressed anger at what he said and at the position of the Labour Party various Muslim councillors have resigned the Labour Muslim Network has asked for an apology will they get one 
Well, we, we, we've, we can't apologise for holding a position that we've never held. Keir has been clear and consistent on this, as but has it wasn't David clear Lamy, on that and day. as have I. It, it wasn't clear on that day with LBC, though, was he? Well, that's, that's, why, that's why he clarified when he was asked about it, to make sure that people hear loud and clear from us and it took that nine international days. law must be upheld. Look, Keir and I met with aid agencies this week to talk about the unfolding crisis, the emergency on the ground. I, I can tell you that we are acutely aware of what is happening in Gaza at the moment and the urgent need to get help to people. We're acutely aware that for Palestinians in Gaza, this didn't start on the 7th of October, that they have been in crisis for over a decade and a half with very little prospect of peace. OK. And do you understand why some Muslim Labour supporters have felt alienated by what he said? I, I completely understand why people in the Muslim community are in extraordinary amounts of pain right now and heard those words and felt very concerned and I'm glad that we've clarified that I'm glad that we've been consistent about that Keir, David Lammy and myself and continue to be consistent about that and I'm glad to be able to make that point on your program okay. Victoria because people are people are very frightened about what's happening to their relatives at the moment they're very very worried about what's happening on the streets of Britain as well and for their own personal safety and it was important for me to be able to go to Friday prayers and express my solidarity with the Muslim community to hear that pain and to assure them that we are doing everything that we can, even from the position of opposition. Right, we well, have influence and we're doing everything that we can to try and resolve let's, this. Let's see if you can be clear about Labour's position then. Do you think Israel breached international law by cutting off water and power supplies? Look, I think this is an extraordinarily complex and fast-moving situation. There are 200 hostages. And what's the answer to the question? Well, look, Israel has a, the right to self-defence and it has a duty to secure the release of its hostages. Sure. But my question but was... To, my but question we have was, to ensure no, my question that international was, do you, law is upheld. Right, and so and my that, question is, do you think Israel has, have, has breached international humanitarian law by cutting off water and fuel supplies? Well, in the last 24 hours, we've seen water, medicine and food enter Gaza. It is in very limited supply at the moment, but I am hopeful that we'll be able to amplify and scale up those efforts urgently. There is a very small window in which a, a, an Israeli government that is responding to fear and pain in Israel and the Egyptian government as well who have serious concerns about the opening of the Rafah crossing may be persuaded with the help of the United States and others to not just allow aid into Gaza but to allow safe passage through Gaza to reach people in the north and, and forgive that's what me, we've I, got to focus on. I, I am going to ask the question again, do you think Israel breached international law by cutting off power and water supplies? Look, I, I'm not going to sit in your studio and grandstand and tell you that I, I'm going to make big pronouncements about what Israel is and isn't doing in what is a very complex, difficult situation where, as you know, a number of your panel have just recognised, Israel is still having rockets fired against its own people from a prescribed terrorist organisation and where you've got 200 hostages sitting in basements in Gaza who haven't yet been released. What we've got to ensure is that international law is upheld. That's why the 20 trucks that got, went into Gaza were very important yesterday, but not sufficient. And that's why all of our efforts are focused on keeping that window open, keeping that crossing open and scaling up those efforts urgently. There is a humanitarian catastrophe looming for people in Gaza, and that's where we've got to focus. Thank you very much for talking to our audience this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Nandy from Labour. Well, as Israel vows to ramp up strikes on the Gaza Strip, they are warning Palestinians still in the north to flee south. Meanwhile, the United Nations has described conditions in Gaza as catastrophic. I've been talking to Dr Hanan Ash Rawi, a veteran Palestinian politician who spent decades campaigning for Palestinian liberation. I asked her for the latest on what's happening in the Gaza Strip. There is really a genocide in the making. Uh, the people are uh, not just besieged and bombed and homes demolished and more than half of the people, 1.2 million, are now uh, homeless, displaced uh, and terrified. There's no water, there's no electricity, there's no food, there's no medicine, no medical supplies and no fuel. So they're worried that the, the 
hospitals will run out of fuel to run the generators. Uh, they have about 13,500 injured. Uh, and, and how can they treat them? How can they deal with them? The hospitals have been bombed. Uh, schools have been bombed. Homes have been bombed and shelled. And uh, universities have been bombed. And it's incredible. This is total devastation. It's beyond catastrophe. I don't know what it is. There's a deliberate attempt at the total destruction of all requirements of a normal life. Israel, um, the Israeli government would absolutely reject that. As you know, they say they say they target, they are targeting Hamas and their military structures. They say they do not target civilians and that they have a right to defend themselves in the wake of the Hamas massacre on Israeli people. If you call that a massacre, you should see all the massacres that happened to the Palestinians. If you use the logic of revenge, then certainly since the creation of the state of Israel, we have been subject as Palestinians to a series of massacres. What have the actions of Hamas meant for the chances of, of any resolution to this long-running conflict? Well, we've tried several times, the PLO, the national program, everybody tried to have a negotiated settlement and it didn't work because Israel insisted on continuing with its occupation, continued on uh, continued with its land grab, its home demolitions, its assassinations and killing of people. And that's what really prevented any kind of uh, peace agreement. I wonder if yes. perhaps if the, all the hostages, all the rest of the hostages uh, held in Gaza were released immediately and unconditionally, that might help. And look, we don't like to see any hostages, any civilian hostages taken. We as Palestinians have been held hostage since 1967. Huh? 80,000 Palestinians have been killed. One million have been imprisoned. We consider all our prisoners hostages. I wonder if you, you do have to acknowledge the barbarity, the brutality of the attack on Israelis in southern Israel by Hamas before, before this can move forwards. Oh, God. I mean, I can't believe I'm hearing the same thing over and over again. This is a preoccupation with the Western media because something happened to Israel for the first time in its history. Everybody's up in arms and its victims have to uh, condemn themselves. Israel has been doing this to us for decades. Piecemeal, day in, day out, people killed, homes demolished. Huh? And, and we're telling you how many Palestinians have been killed by a brutal Israeli occupation. Total siege in Gaza, total destruction and land theft in the West Bank. Nobody brings Hamas spokespeople, uh, Israeli spokespeople and say, do you condemn this? Isn't this brutal? Isn't this genocide? Isn't this? No. But the moment people under siege, look at Gaza. It, it's an area where people haven't had a day of normal life. Huh? And, and then when they lash out, when they break out, immediately all sorts of horrific labels are used. Were the Israeli grab. citizens that, legitimate the targets? The is using, as I said, this largely. Are using you, this largely. I just want to be we clear. Can, are you, can, exactly. I just want to be clear. Are you saying that the Israeli citizens were legitimate targets? No, I don't believe in civilians being legitimate targets at all. At all. In the same way as we are not legitimate targets of Israel, our homes, our lands, are not at its disposal. Our freedom, our rights have been denied. No, they don't put words in my mouth. Okay. Ne never. Civilians are never legitimate targets. But what I'm talking about is the double standard. Okay. Israel is an occupying power. This has to be acknowledged. Israel has been torturing the Palestinians since 1947. It is time this stops without constantly looking for excuses and blaming the victim. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashrawi. Thank you for being with us this morning. We appreciate your time. Your well, listening to that was Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, your reaction, first of all. Well, we abhor violence and the loss of innocent lives on both sides of this terrible conflict. We do believe it is absolutely essential that Israel has the ability to defend itself, to secure its people after the murderous, barbaric attack by Hamas. And ultimately, it's by 
degrading and eradicating Hamas, that both Israelis and Palestinians will have a path to peace. Now, on Friday night, two US hostages were released, as you know. Rishi Sunak today, writing in a Sunday newspaper, says the first thing we must do is support the families of British victims and get the hostages back. How confident are you that you will be able to get British hostages out? Well, the first thing to say is we should celebrate the release of two innocent civilians who are now out of the appalling situation that they're in. We are working intensively with all our partners across the region to secure the release of British nationals who are being held hostage by Hamas. The and Prime are Minister you confident that will happen? Well, I, I can't comment on the specific uh, cases. I hope you can understand that. It's just too, I'm not asking you too, to. too serious a situation uh, to do so. These things are best handled privately and quietly, but what the families of those people should know is that the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary are doing absolutely everything they can. And that's one of the reasons why they've been talking to our partners across the region, raising that at the highest level, including important interlocutors like Qatar, to try to secure their release. There are also uh, British nationals trapped in the Gaza Strip. Do you know how many? Are you going to be able to get them out? And what is it that's stopping people with British passports and other foreign passports being able to get out of the Gaza Strip? Well, we have a list of British nationals who are in Gaza. Those are British passport holders who, and their dependents who have registered with the Foreign Office. We're keeping in close contact with them and we want to secure their safe passage And do you know what's stopping Gaza. them coming out? What's, what's the hold-up? Well, we have secured, along with other partners, the supply of humanitarian aid through the Rafa crossing, but not yet foreign nationals, including British nationals, ability to leave through the Rafa crossing. That's one of the things that the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary have raised with President Sisi in Egypt. We understand some of their legitimate concerns, the difficult situation that Egypt finds itself in, but we're working very hard to try and get those individuals out as quickly as we can. Of course, we're also playing our part in getting that crucial aid, food, water, medical supplies uh, and other support into Gaza so that individuals there of all nationalities can get some relief from the crisis that they find themselves in. And it's critical that we do that and also that well, we ensure... And Rishi, Rishi Sunak, again, writing in this newspaper, says we need to see all water supplies to Gaza restored where physically possible. Have, you, have the Israelis given you any guarantee that that is going to happen? Uh, we have been raising with Israel and indeed with, with Egypt. Well, I I Israel doesn't want to see innocent Palestinians suffer. Their war is with Hamas, which is but, but, but a murderous off the terrorist sure, regime. Sure, but turning off the water affects all Palestinian people, not just Hamas. Well, as I say, the good news is that the first aid has now got through. No, and, I know that. And I'm we've contributed you... to that by raising it at the very highest levels. We want to see much more, because that, that's just a welcome first step and we're okay. coordinating very closely with the United Nations. One issue is to ensure that Hamas don't divert any of the, um, the supplies that are provided, particularly uh, energy supplies, for their own activities and that what does go into Gaza exclusively goes to support the innocent civilian population. Rishi Sunak has been visiting various countries last week. James Cleverley was at that peace summit in Cairo yesterday. The British government is putting itself at the heart of, of the diplomatic efforts. So it'd be good to know if you have got a clear vision for how this conflict could be resolved. President Biden saying last week, don't make the same mistakes America and its allies, the UK did after 9-11. Do, does the UK government agree that Israel needs a clear plan for what happens the day after? Uh, it gets rid of Hamas, assuming it does. Well, this is one of the reasons why the Prime Minister has been engaging with all of our partners and allies throughout the region. And we do think that the UK has a role as a very close friend uh, and supporter of Israel, but also a close partner of a number of other countries in the region. The first step is for Israel to be able to secure its borders and to degrade and eradicate Hamas. And after that? They need to do that, if I, if I could just say, they need to do that in a surgical way that respects uh, the civilian population uh, in Gaza. After that, of course, we want to work towards a world in which there are two states, 
Israel and Palestine free of the tyranny of Hamas, in which the Israeli and Palestinian people can live side by side. That is okay. a long way off today. It is. So let me ask you about the middle bit. The I'm actions of Hamas. Let's imagine Hamas is destroyed. Who replaces Hamas to govern Gaza? Well, I'm not going to speculate on the options, but those are conversations that are being discussed by uh, international leaders. But Do, does I the think, British government have a view, a well, strategy, a vision? Well, we are working with our partners. But I say that, that there is a crucial first step here, which is that we've got to get Hamas degraded, eradicated out of Gaza, because it's impossible to see a way to peace when you have a regime running Gaza which is dedicated yeah. to the destruction of Israel and to the murder of Jewish people. Right. So that is the essential And that's what Joe Biden was talking about. To moving forward. About not f doing this, you know, making the same mistakes as the UK and the US and other allies did post Saddam Hussein. There was no plan for post Saddam Hussein. And that's what I'm asking you about post Hamas. If Israeli troops managed to eliminate Hamas, the Israelis have said they won't be responsible for life in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Authority have indicated they won't go back into Gaza. There needs to be a plan, doesn't there? There does, and that's why the UK is playing a leading role in this. But, and have you but, got an idea of a plan? That's not something that uh, we or indeed Israel have spoken you know, publicly about. What we want to do is to listen to the views of Israel and to uh, leaders within the Arab world. I think that's incredibly important and it's something that perhaps didn't happen uh, in the conflicts that you've spoken about in the recent past. We want to listen and use the unique role that the UK actually has, which is an interlocutor that is trusted both by partners like Egypt and a number of the Gulf states, okay. but also, of course, crucially by Israel. But as I say, sure. the first step, which has to happen, is that Israel have to be able to act to defend themselves and, you've made and that get point. rid of Hamas. Yeah. Should Britain accept refugees from Israel and Gaza, like we did Ukrainians, uh, if they want to come here? Well, I think that for the reasons you've just described, that's a bit premature. The first step... Why? Because at the moment we're still working with Egypt and others to get British nationals out of Gaza, and we're trying to get aid into sure. Gaza. So that, if, that's, that's that what we happens, have to do And if we're first. in a position whereby Gazans or Israelis want to flee and want safe haven in the UK, would you set up a scheme similar to the one the UK did for Ukrainian people? Well, I don't think that the first step that the UK should do when there is a conflict or a humanitarian disaster around the world is to reach for migration as the solution. I wasn't the, suggesting it would be the first step. The, the, the best thing that the UK can do in these situations is to use our diplomatic heft and to use our very generous and significant international development aid budget to support people in places like Gaza. And that is what the UK intends to do. We're coordinating closely with the UN and looking to see whether there are more things that we could do on the humanitarian front okay. in the coming days. That's our priority at the moment. Right. Um, let's talk about domestic news. Obviously, uh, last week's by-elections, they've been described by Professor Sir John Curtis, the elections guru, as spectacular losses for your party. You've had 48 hours now to reflect on what happened. Does the buck stop with Rishi Sunak? Well, we're all disappointed by those results. Of course we are. And does the buck stop with him? Well, the, Rishi Sunak is the Prime Minister, but we are so, all, yes. we're all in government responsible for uh, the Conservative Party and what we're doing to deliver for the British public. I think the Prime Minister uh, is making good progress. We're working extremely hard. We have the right priorities which match those of the public. The key thing uh, how do you, is how that do we you actually deliver on those priorities. Sure. Where, where do you see progress? Because we certainly didn't see it on Thursday night, did we? Well, in terms of what we are delivering for the public, I see that inflation is starting to come down. I see that the economy is growing. In my own brief, I see that we're beginning to make progress on stopping the boats. It's numbers do, it's are, not, numbers what, are falling substantially. It's not, it doesn't seem to be having any effect, though, if you look at what happened in Tamworth and Mid-Beds. I mean, in Tamworth, Labour overturned a majority of almost 19,000. In Mid-Beds, a majority of 25,000. Well, you know, with all due respect, I wouldn't read too much into by-elections. Governments tend to lose by-elections. I was elected in a by-election uh, nine years ago, and at that point, the Conservative Party hadn't won a by-election in government for 25 years. They are massive so majorities that, that, with double-digit it, swings. Are you in denial? I, I think we all have to listen to what the voters are saying in those by-elections, but we also shouldn't read too much into them. My sense is that the public 
uh, are undecided. They're certainly not sold on Keir Starmer. Conservative voters want a good but reason they just to come won two by -elections. and vote for Labour us. Labour just won but those two by-elections. The, the key thing for us as a party right now is not to worry about party politics, but to deliver on the public's priorities. People are worried about the cost of living. They want, want us to bear down on inflation, which we're doing. They want us to have a strategy to grow the economy, and it is growing. And on areas of absolutely critical domestic concern, like uh, illegal migration, which I'm responsible for, they want us to get on and stop the boats. And I'm pleased to say, although there's clearly a long way to go in this regard, our plan is beginning to bear fruit. Right. The well, numbers crossing are falling, whilst they're rising by over 100%. Sure. But you're nowhere near like stopping Italy. them, which was the promise. No, we, and, we and want the to stop them entirely. But if you'd said to me and the a year NHS ago, waiting list continued could we going be up. the only country in Europe where they're falling, how, I would have said that's difficult. How worried are you about your own seat? Because you've only got a majority of 21,816. Well, any member of parliament would be foolish to be uh, complacent. We all have to work hard and be good constituency MPs. That's what I try to do every day. But as the government's priority is looking at the public's uh, challenges like the economy, like immigration, okay. like public services, okay. and working day in, day out for the rest of this parliament to deliver for the British public. Did you, sorry, did you just say a moment or two ago that you never said you stopped the boats entirely? Can I just check you said that? No, I, what, what I said was that we are working to, to stop the boats completely. That, right. is, that is our objective. Okay. But, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not a simple task. And anyone who would say that doesn't understand the issue. It's one of the most challenging issues facing right. any developed country in the world today. And do you think, but our plan and do is you, actually and, working. And do you, do you think Rishi Sunak's A-levels reform and smoking ban is going to get your base out in time for a general election? Well, I think people care passionately about education and the prospects of I don't of, see people marching in the streets children. wanting reform of A-levels. Um, I think people in a constituency like mine do want to see good technical and vocational education that is of the same parity of esteem as academic qualifications like A-levels. And if we can bring Does, Is them... that coming up on the doorstep then? Is that why you introduced it? Uh, it, it is actually. The Prime Minister... Come on. No. Well, uh, if, People are saying to you on the doorstep, oh, we if, need to if, change A-levels. If, if you come to a constituency like mine, where the majority of people have not gone to university, have got many people have got technical and vocational qualifications. They want to think that those have the same esteem as A-levels. They don't believe in the constant drive for people uh, to go to university is the only route for success in okay. life. And if we can bring them together into a globally respected qualification, I think that's a very positive thing. I and want these to... are examples, if I may, of why we are taking long-term difficult decisions that tackle real problems it's and just set that, the country up It's just that you're success. not seeing it in, in, in the by-elections, for example. Well, well let's let, see. Let, 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 it's a challenging time. What we will sure. do is keep focusing on those issues. Let me ask you about cutting taxes, because we know what your argument is against cutting taxes. There are a number of people, uh, a number of voices in your party who are getting louder and louder, who are saying, look, the only way to win the election, whenever it is, is to cut those taxes and you need to bite the bullet and do it. Are you listening to them? Uh, well, look, we all want to cut taxes. Everyone wants lower taxes. As a Conservative, it is one of the central tenets of conservatism that well, we believe in, in lower taxes. But You may believe first, in it, but actions speak louder well, than the words. We've got the task, highest tax burden for decades. The first task has got to be bearing down on inflation because it's ultimately inflation today and in the last couple of years since the pandemic, which has been the great evil which has been eroding people's savings leading to mortgages rising if we can get that under control and it seems like our plan is working the governor of the bank of england said that we should be on course to halve inflation by the end of the year then of course we'll consider what more we should do but you can trust the conservatives to make sensible prudent decisions on the future of can the economy we? and to bring down taxes Liz when it's ago? capable to do so. Have you forgotten Liz Truss a year well, ago? Well, look at the difference that we've seen in the last 12 months under Rishi Sunak. The fact that we have stabilised the economy, that it's growing, that inflation is falling and critical issues like immigration, we're making significant progress for the first time in a long time. Although legal migration was at a net record high in the latest figures, but we must leave it there. Thank you very much, Thank Robert you. Jenrick, the Immigration Minister. Uh, let us know what you think of what you're hearing this morning. Uh, here are the details. You can contact us by emailing koonsberg at bbc.co.uk or on social media using the hashtag BBCLawaK. We absolutely love to hear from you. And if you want to read the headlines as they unfold, just go to the BBC Live page. It's bbc.co.uk forward slash news. 
Well, we started this morning by asking how this conflict can be resolved. A lot of that depends on Israel's plan for what comes next. Uh, former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett was leader of the Jewish Home Party and has described himself as more right-wing than the current Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. And we can talk to him now. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Um, I wonder if you can tell us where you think Israel is right now with the imminent ground invasion. Well, our objective is uh, for the citizens of Israel to be able to return to their homes in the south and to have uh, the hostages released. Uh, that's our goal. And we want to be able to live with security and peace, the families here in the town of Zderot and tens of thousands of other families to know that never again uh, will they be under rockets, uh, terror attacks, etc. from uh, Gaza. The implication of that is that we uh, need to demilitarize uh, Gaza. And that's the stated goal of the government. Okay. Well, uh, well we, we... So we are, we are planning uh, a counteroffensive uh, against uh, this uh, Hamas ISIS type uh, organization. So we saw two US hostages released and I wonder does a ground incursion into Gaza make it less likely you will get the rest of the hostages out? Well, there's no option but to eradicate Hamas and uh, if anyone has a better idea how to eradicate the, this Hamas ISIS uh, let me know. But, but, but uh, do you, that, that's our, our, what I'm asking you is, does it make it harder to get the hostages out? The hostages is one of the objectives. The other objective is to eradicate Hamas. So this sort of thing can never happen again. We uh, thought that we can uh, contain and live side by side with uh, this uh, Hamas uh, state. That was a mistake across the board. And uh, we're going to fix it. Writing in the British press this morning, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says Palestinian people in Gaza are suffering terribly at the moment. Our Foreign Secretary says that the 20 aid trucks that went in to Gaza uh, from Egypt was a good start. Will more aid be allowed in? Look, uh, the, the world can come and uh, help the Gazans. Uh, that's none of our business. Our business, then, the Israeli government is allowing uh, that sort of aid in. But uh, my approach is humanitarian for humanitarian. It has to be reciprocal. Uh, and we right now have uh, hundreds of uh, Israeli citizens, uh, including five-month-old babies, held hostage. So if we're focused on humanitarian, it has to be reciprocal. And I would tie the two. I mean, uh, if it, you it, want. I, I understand that, but it, it is your business, isn't it? Because you have to clearly demonstrate that your fight is with Hamas and not with the Palestinian people. So what is your question? You said it wasn't your business, the humanitarian situation of Gazans. No, we, we are not responsible for Gaza, just like you're not responsible for France. Uh, if others want to... Uh, take care of the Gazans, that's theirs to do. They got a full-blown uh, Palestinian Gazan state in uh, 2005. But you, we handed you... over the entire, hold on, we handed over the entire uh, area, we pulled out our soldiers, we, we uh, expelled the Jews living in Gaza and gave it to, actually to Mahmoud Abbas, and there was no siege or anything. The problem is that from days after that, they started shooting rockets at us. But and you do uh, control the borders. Problem. You do control the borders. And so cutting off water, food, fuel affects all Gazans, not just Hamas. Let me be clear now. We have an ISIS state next to us. OK. And, you know, this ISIS state, uh, we are experienced in terror. Yes, we were surprised, but we will win. But the West is next. Uh, you know, if you, if you think that it's not going to hit London, you're mistaken. It will. Radical Islam terror will hit everywhere. We saw uh, ISIS kill a couple of uh, fans in Brussels just a few days ago. It, you're next. So we're fighting a war to, that ultimately um, needs to and will defend the rest of the world from radical Islam. I understand now, that. I understand we're, we're, that. We're and, and here's what we're doing on the humanitarian side. We have told all the Gazans from northern Gaza to move to the south 
before we take action there, because our goal is for Gazan uh, civilians not to die. We deliberately go out of our way to prevent that from happening as far as we can. The problem is that Hamas, ISIS, is uh, using them as human shields. Right. And but I, and our, I, our big lesson is that we're going to defend ourselves. Sure, I understand that, and I hear your words very, very clearly. You will know that the head of the UN and many others have said wars have rules. And forgive me if I uh, quote some of the Geneva Convention to you. Article 43, basic rule, the parties to the conflict shall confine their operations to the destruction or weakening of the military resources of the adversary and shall make a distinction between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives. So I That's come exactly what we're doing. That's exactly why we are allowing the c civilians to evacuate yeah. before pounding them. We're doing but the it, opposite. It's, it's not exactly what, what you're doing. No, uh, it's wait, not you, exactly asked, you asked the question, what, would you let me answer? Go ahead. What Hamas, ISIS did is they entered roughly 30 communities. Whenever they can, they butchered babies. They burnt them alive. They pulled a, a baby out of a pregnant mom's and, and then beheaded the baby beheaded the mom, they raped young girls. This is what we're dealing with. And with all due respect, I think the Geneva Conventions first and foremost tell a country, you need to defend yourself and we will defend ourselves. We're going out of our way. I know that uh, last week a hospital was uh, uh, fired by Islamic Jihad that fired a rocket on it and BBC said that it was Israel, but it wasn't Israel. And I understand that BBC has taken a side of uh, uh, on the Gazan side because all your questions are only about the Gazan civilians. That's not you true. You haven't asked one that's question. That's not you haven't true. asked one question I, I began about by those children. That, from the very beginning of this interview, from you the very just are asking me about them. Mr. But Bennett, it seems that, that is you not care true. little about our side. Oh, it is. Mr. What Bennett, I began, I, began, about our side? I began by talking about the hostages. And what I'm asking you about now is... No, I'm not talking is, about the hostages. I'm talking about the babies that were murdered. And you keep on caring only about one side, but that is the BBC way. But uh, let me let me tell you something. We're here protecting you. You're, we don't need your protection. And if you think there's a, a balance here between two equal sides, then you are lacking moral clarity. And BBC, I must say, is lacking moral clarity. What you guys did last week, shame on you. Before we spoke to you, Mr. Bennett, I spoke to a, a veteran Palestinian politician and I asked her about the massacre of Israeli citizens in southern Israel. I want to ask you now about the long term strategy. What, who runs, let's say the Israeli military manages to wipe out Hamas. Who runs Gaza the day after? Well, I assume uh, they'll develop a uh, civilian leadership uh, based on the localities and on the Gazans themselves, but it won't be Hamas. Right. Do you, what about what Joe Biden said last week, which is, of course, Israel has the right to defend itself, but do not make the mistakes that the US, the UK made after 9-11. What do you think he means by that? Well, I don't know. You need to ask him. What I know is that our big mistake is that for uh, 20 years, we have again and again uh, listened to the world We've always uh, contained this. We never went out to eradicate Hamas. That was the biggest mistake we made. And that's this the rest of the world's... Of, yeah. Was that the rest of the world's fault then, rather than... No, it's our own... fault. It's, it's our fault. It's only Israel's fault. Though the world uh, back then and now is, is basically telling us, cool down, let's go for a ceasefire. So my, our big mistake is that we listen to the world. Uh, I, I'm not blaming the world. The world has always been hypocritic. Uh, about the Jewish state. I'm blaming us for listening to them because at the end of the day, we have to protect ourselves. And, you know, I assume you wouldn't want uh, ISIS to live in your neighborhood and you would demand that your government eradicate ISIS. That's what our people want too, and we're going to do that. At some point, will Israeli politicians have to sit down with Palestinian politicians to talk about the long term? Look, uh, when I, I'm fine with any talks always, but uh, the truth is, unfortunately, that uh, Hamas enjoys massive public Palestinian support. That's the sad truth that 
we sort of like to. Well, we don't hide know that. that. We actually don't know that. The, oh, the, oh, oh, we actually do. The, the last you know elections. Why? Let me give you. The last elections were in two thousand and six. Yeah, and and you know that uh, Hamas got a full majority, an overwhelming majority of the electorates. It was a decade and, and a half then, ago. Uh, I'm uh, fine. Uh, I, I go go and do elections. I can tell you that right. Ah, apologies. I do apologise. Uh, I'm not sure why the signal cut out at the end. Right, let's go back to our panel. Um, Lucy Fisher. Um, uh, Jasmine, actually, let me start with you. First of all, what do you make of what Mr Bennett has just been saying? <clears throat> it's hard to know where to begin in terms of answering some of the things that Naftali Bennett was just saying. But let me start by actually saying I was incredibly struck by how he talked about Israeli aspirations. He said, <clears throat> people want to return to their homes, people want to live in security, and people do not want to live under rockets. You could literally be talking about the Palestinian people right now. And I mentioned that because I think that what people seem to forget and what politicians seem to forget that I've been hearing for the last two weeks is this is an issue of humanity. This is not an issue of two different people whose lives are weighed differently. And Mr. Naftali Bennett just proved that by how he was talking about things. And, we but, all, we, and, and, sorry, and just a really quick, because there was a lot of sort of mixing between different terrorist organizations here. And I want to make one thing very clear. When he says that he has a Hamas state next to him, if that was a Hamas, if Gaza was a Hamas state, Hamas would control entry they would control borders, they would control fuel, water, electricity, they control none of those things Israel does. So when he talks about Israel's responsibility towards Gaza, whether it's humanitarian or otherwise, if you can literally flick on a switch and decide whether a baby dies or not, there are 130 babies, by the way, now, preemies, premature babies, who are about to die, they are about to die because there is a lack of fuel. Their lives count just as much as precious Israeli babies who are killed. So we have to we have to just equalize that. We have to be able to say these are two people okay. whose lives matter in the same way. And to say that you are not responsible for that is quite disingenuous. And we have to push back on that. I wonder, Simon, from what we've heard this morning, both from uh, Naftali Bennett, from Dr. Hanan Ashwari, and also from, from uh, Robert Jenrick, who is representing the government this morning, do you hear anything about a long-term strategy? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot has to be done right now. It's extremely difficult to fight your way into this territory. Um, I, I really listened to it this time, and I think, I think more people should, to moderate Arab voices from the Arab world. Um, there, was a spe there was a speech this week by Prince Turki bin Faisal, one of the sort of most respected Saudi statesmen, you know, and he, who knows the Arab world better than many of the commentators here, who, um, many of whom actually have been sympathetic to Hamas, um, you know, he really attacked Hamas for undermining the peace, the, the Saudi peace with Israel, um, which the Saudis, well, that's, that's which, what they want. Which the Saudis believe would have would have improved Palestinian rights and yeah. representation in the West Bank, and that was the idea. So one has to remember, Hamas's aim here was to destroy those relationships um, has it with succeeded? the Arab world. It may well have succeeded, um, but we mustn't let it. But it, it, its aim was also to stop what Hamas was, has been Hamas's chief aim since it was founded in the early 90s, late 80s, which was to stop a two-state solution. And of course, you know, I, I, I feel more strongly than ever that a two-state solution is the only way to go here. But it's going to take a few years after this tragedy. But I would say one thing to Jasmine, which is like, of course, Israel does control the borders of, of Gaza. But considering that, Hamas did manage to get a massive amount of military hardware into that state. And when one listens to Arab voices in the, like, moderate, like, um, like uh, Prince Turkey bin Faisal, and also the brilliant female Arab interview at Al Arab Arabiya, Nasha Nabil, who interviewed Khalid Mashal this week. I'm sure you saw yeah, it. Um, you know, we should all listen to these interviews because she accused him of using, and this is, remember, this is an Arab, I think she's a Saudi interviewer, you, you will know. Um, she accused him of using the Palestinian people as human shields. This is an Arab yes, commentator, not it. an Israeli it. commentator. And she said, that, you know, how many people are you going to kill 
you're going to get killed by this kind of completely disgusting, barbaric operation. And his answer, which was very important, is he said, Russia lost 30 million people to defeat Germany. So that's sort of, that, I mean, that is Hamas's um, yeah, he seemed uh, to be suggesting that, that, that many Palestinian lives would be lost in this cause. Hamas is a terrorist let, organization let, let, that, that's, that's deliberately using the, the Palestinian people. Where do you think, Lucy, the, the diplomacy goes next? Because there is so much to do. Well, there's so much to do. We've seen a flurry of that this week. Um, Arab partners, uh, Western leaders, Biden, Sunak, flying into the region for talks. I was really struck that after the hospital explosion in Gaza on Tuesday, um, Jordan cancelled a summit with Egypt, um, with uh, the Palestinian President uh, Mahmoud Abbas, with Joe Biden. And I think that just shows how uh, diplomacy is really at the mercy of events. You know, we can see these sort of talks, uh, you know, derailed very easily. I was struck listening to both um, Robert Jenrick and Lisa Nandy uh, today on the show, not willing to even give voice to some of the options for a long-term strategy of how Gaza is governed. I wasn't particularly convinced by uh, Naftali Bennett's idea, well, some solution will come from Gaza itself. I think we need to hear from Israel a bit more detail in coming days about what uh, they are planning. We've heard in the past 48 hours or so their suggestion that they will cut ties altogether. That could mean that they cut the electricity supplies that they gave heretofore before the most recent siege, uh, as well as stopping any Gazans being allowed over the border to work. So it really does feel like the enclave is just going to be completely cut off from the entire world unless a solution is found. What do you want to see happen next? What I want to see happen next is to set up a pathway for negotiations, right? If we think about two things that have to be that have to happen for a successful negotiation to go through, you have to have at least some semblance of trust between the parties. And if you have no trust, then you need a trusted intermediary, and trusted by both. And th that's, I was gonna get to, let me, I'll get sorry, to that in a sorry. second. The second thing you have to do is find a way for both of those parties to be able to save face in their respective environments to come out of it saying, we got this, right? So those are the two things you need for a successful, potentially successful mm. negotiation. So if we work backwards from there and we look at the way that Israel has conducted operations in Gaza over the last two weeks, and this is before a ground invasion, my question to them, and by the way, before anyone says anything, I believe every state has a right to defend itself. Israel is no exception. So let me get that out of the way. So um, there, there is defense and there is extreme offense. There is defense and there is 4,000 people dead in two weeks, over 1,800 of them children, right? So if you, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because if you're creating that type of environment, what Arab leader is right now going to want to come in and stick their neck out for you and say, I will help you with these negotiations? Okay. What, what population is going to be governed if 4,000 people have died in two weeks? And, and, and by Prime Minister Netanyahu's admission, this could take weeks or even years. So these are the kinds of things we have to be thinking about now, strategically, rationally, so that we can come to a long-term solution. We're, we're actually nearly at the end of the yeah. programme. Who, who, in terms of a broker, who is that country? Who, is, who, who are you? Traditionally, Egypt and Jordan have right. both played huge roles in the region, so that those are two potential um, okay. brokers. The Saudis have to be involved in this yeah. now. And the US on Israel. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you so much, all of you. We are out of time, but we really appreciate your insight and your contributions today. Thank you. Uh, for more, do join uh, Paddy O'Connell and myself for the weekend newscast. We'll be recording straight after the programme and it'll be on BBC Sounds by lunchtime. That's it from all of us here this morning. Have a good day.